For those of you who don't know me, my name is Maxine Ligue. I'm the Associate Director of the First Year Experience Program and the Community Action Learning and Leadership Program at SUNY Old Westbury. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to um, thank you all for coming to hear the first of hopefully many OWLS talks presented by the TLRC. And I also wanted to thank the members of the TLRC for um, thinking about this endeavor and bringing it to fruition. I think it's an excellent idea. So I was told that the theme of this year's talk was going to be breaking the spell. And breaking the spell, I think, means deciphering this unnameable magic when it comes to teaching and learning in college, and especially at this particular college. And you're probably here today to hear me divine the needs of first year students or to learn the magical methods of how to engage them. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but that is not going to be this type of presentation. So instead, what I'm going to do is tell you the magical but completely true tale of how this presentation came to be. And I'm hoping it'll be just as informative as numbers and data and tips and whatnot. OK, so when I agreed to give this presentation, um, I was actually in the middle of preparing another presentation about FYE's Ethics of Engagement course. And as part of that presentation, I had access to all of this um, material, all of the student material. There were journal excerpts, there was music, there was poetry, there was essays, performances, and all of this were produced by first year students, all here. It was all critically engaging and analyzing course content and social issues. And because this presentation can only be like 10 to 15 minutes, um, I actually will not go through all the content, although maybe we can go through it during the Q&A. But this is a link to one of our um, professors in the first year program and the English department. This is the blog to one of his ethics of engagement courses. And I'll go over some of the material in the Q&A. So anyway, so I thought to myself that there's all this amazing stuff. And I told myself that I wasn't going to talk about what first year students need because really the only thing they need is opportunity. I told myself that by the time I was done with this presentation and after I regaled you with all of the anecdotes of the incredible adventures of first year, which was, was supposed to be the original talk of this, original title of this talk, um, that you guys would be breaking down the doors to the first year experience office with this burning desire to teach a first year course. Well, then, this happened, this being the newly installed first year student support initiative. And this is the six week evaluation of that initiative. And basically, I found myself staring at a list of about 70 students who had been identified as struggling in their courses. And I felt all this pressure. And I felt this pressure because these evaluations reflected very real struggles for both students and faculty who completed and maybe didn't complete this evaluation. And they were very real problems. And for those of you who know me, I am nothing if not a problem solver. So then I told myself I was going to use this OWL's talk to brainstorm and troubleshoot some of the main struggles that were found on the first year student support initiative. So I went to my little cafe um, where I get my best work done. And as I sat down to prepare this talk, I found myself asking questions like, well, why are students so difficult to engage? Why don't they understand when assignments are due? What is getting in the way of them showing up to class or showing up at all? Um, why don't they understand when assignments are due? Don't they read the syllabus? Don't they read at all? And that line of thinking started bothering me because well, I found myself thinking, yeesh, why do I like working with freshmen again? Like I literally could not remember what was so special, so magical, so awesome about the first year student. So here I was trying to put together this presentation on the incredible adventures of first year, and the magic of first year was lost to me. I had totally scrooged out. I was sitting down, I was going to write Ryoko this Dear John email about why I could no longer do this talk. 
It was going to read something like, Dear Ryoko, it's me, not you, whatever, <laughs> bah humbug. So what I'm about to tell you next, though, will seem straight out of a fairy tale, but I swear it's true. I had my very own A Christmas Carol scenario, except it was about the first year of college, and while there were no ghosts per se, because all the people I encountered were alive, I did have my interactions with my very own first year, spirits of first year, past, present, and future. So, as I was drafting this email to Ryoko, because I was going to do it, I got a call from my younger brother who's about to start college. He's starting a little late. And he starts asking me all these questions about classes and campus life and professors. And basically, I'm just debunking all these myths that he has about college. And he goes to me, oh, I'm so confused. This never happened to George Michael. George Michael being George Michael Bluth from Arrested Development. And when he said that, it was like I time traveled back to my freshman year in college. It was my first week, and I was stoked. I had finally gotten rid of my parents. My room was all set up, and my roommate was not a horrid she vamp. I had just gotten my class schedule and my book list. I was able to make it to the bookstore and navigate the maze of shelves to find my intro to biology textbook. And then I looked at the price tag of that textbook and I froze. Now, I can't remember how I made it to the financial aid office or even why I went there, except you know, the financial aid office is somehow billed as like a bank, so students tend to go there when they need money. But what I do remember is that I burst into tears in front of the financial aid counselor, and I literally blubbered, why is this book so expensive, and why didn't this ever happen to Felicity? Felicity being this character um, that I watched when I was in high school about her life in college, and I swore that college was going to be like that. And that wasn't the first time something like that happened to me. There was the time that I didn't go to class for almost a month because me being from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I had no idea how people survived winter in upstate New York. There was the more than one occasion where I packed up all of my belongings and told myself that I was done with college and my roommate had to talk me down. There was a lot of incidents that, about me struggling in college and I actually did well in college. I actually liked school. So, Anyway, it was in this discussion with my little brother that I realized that all students have stories prior to getting to college, and this includes the story of college and what it's like. And this story of college is shaped by students' families and friends, and in the absence of actual people in their social circle who have been to college, it's usually shaped by popular culture. And this story makes students think that college is this ticket to the good life, or it's this layover on the ride to adulthood and work, or that maybe it's just a little bit warmer than they expected it to be. But pretty much, no matter what that story of college is, it casts a spell over us. So I finished speaking with my little brother, and while I still hadn't recovered the magic of first year, I decided that maybe I would put off this email to Ryoko for later. So I packed up my computer, I left my little cafe, I got into my car, and out of the speaker comes the voice of my spirit of first year present. And she said, as a nation, we've concentrated a lot on getting low income students into college. What we haven't focused on is whether those students complete college. By some estimates, just one out of every four low income students that attend college make it through graduation. The reasons, as it turns out, often have little to do with money. So apparently I left my radio on, and I had tuned in just in time to catch a program on NPR called Breaking Ground. Now, I listen to public radio pretty regularly, but that was the first time I've ever heard of this segment, and I haven't seen it again or heard of it again, and I was riveted. The program basically documented the experiences of low-income and first-generation students, and I was hearing tidbits like, people believe college is transformative and opens up all these opportunities. I think all of those things can be true, but the transformation is created by going through college and learning skills that are necessary for college. I think our romantic idea was that simply showing up on campus was enough. Or, all three were very good students in high school, 
yet they struggled academically when they got to MSU. Having to take remedial courses makes it less likely a student will graduate, and this is especially difficult and discouraging to low-income students because our courses use up their student loan money while not earning any college credit. Or, there's also the culture of college, which many students don't realize is different from high school. Or, and this is my favorite one, professors were saying, you speak very well, you know how to critically analyze what we're talking about, but when it comes to writing that paper, there's something that's missing. And the student says, and I just remember thinking back to high school, why didn't anybody catch these mistakes? Or why didn't anyone correctly correct me before I got to college? And the last one, because my mom doesn't speak English. She has a lot of health issues, so I would be the main translator to go with her to the doctor's appointment. I remember one day, freshman year, she called me, and she was actually crying in the voicemail and was like, I'm lost. I don't know where I am right now. Come home. I miss you. Ugh, God, it was just like, that's my mom. I think you all get the picture. Now, even though the students in the radio program were attending Michigan State or VCU, their experiences were the same or very similar to students who go to school at Old Westbury. It was like the makers of this documentary were flies on the wall during some of my advising sessions with students, or even some of my therapy sessions and students in my former life as a therapist here. And then I remembered, once students get into college, their pre-existing stories and experiences start butting up against the existing culture of college. Navigating this process takes a period of adjustment, and that period has to be acknowledged by members of the institution, by administration, by faculty, by staff, by everyone. Otherwise, we are unwittingly setting students up for failure. Okay, so clearly at this point, my icy mood was thawing. I didn't end up finishing the program that night, but I was re-engaged with material and my presentation. I walked into my house with first year students on the brain, and there sitting on the couch was my spirit of first year yet to come, AKA my roommate. Now, my roommate happens to be a high school guidance counselor in one of our local school districts where we recruit students. And of course, we're roomies, we talk about work sometimes, but it's usually not that in depth. That night, however, she clearly saw that something was bothering me, so I spilled. I told her about my presentation, about my confusion, about why so many students were struggling, about how I lost the magic of first year. She looked at me in the way I imagined a seasoned veteran looks at a fresh recruit, and she said, colleges are confused about why students are struggling? Well, I can tell you why. They don't have any real information about support students had in high school. Um, they don't have or probably don't use the data about high school graduation rates in the districts where they recruit, and they don't know the services in place that allow us to graduate students. And on the flip side, we in the high schools are not really understanding how to get students ready to succeed in environments like college. So there's more of this to come. Then she went in on all the details about high school stats, about her job as a guidance counselor in the district. She even offered to come to Old Westbury to speak, so if you guys want to hear from a high school guidance counselor, she's available. Um, and then she says, you know, Maxine, there's a lot that goes into my job. And yes, some students may need more than others, but sometimes all a student really needs is someone who will listen to his or her story. Then it's like, they can do anything. And just like that, poof, I remembered the magic, the true meaning of first year. It's really about stories and bearing witness to the transformation that first year students undergo on their way to becoming not only college students, but also active citizens in the world. Sometimes, in our excitement to teach them the things we're passionate about, it's easy to forget that this transformation is happening. And of course, we should be teaching students. Of course, students need skills. But we have to remember that it is just as important to acknowledge and bear witness to their stories and experiences. Because when we do that, 
then they can do anything. So, is it really that simple? Well, why not? After all, all it took to wake an entire village from a hundred years of sleep was true love's kiss. All it took to allow a woman to escape captivity was the utterance of a single name. And for those of you who aren't into fairy tales and fiction, like I am, all it ever takes to solve even the most complex of problems is a small group of people make, making a concerted, concerted effort to do things differently. So yes, maybe it is that simple. Maybe that's the unnameable magic. Maybe the key to breaking the spell of the first year is just being present and listening to a story. The end. Thank you.